Apocalypse is a word usually associated with disaster or catastrophe, but the root of the word means revelation or unveiling. So apocalypse is revelation, but it is also destruction, a revelation that is itself destructive. What is revealed is that the world has an end. For the Jewish intellectual Jakob Taubus, this means that apocalypticism is revolutionary. The world has a beginning and an end. Another world, a new now, is possible. But for another world to be possible, this world must end. The history of coal is a history of this world. It is the history of extraction, of industrialization, of colonialism, and a way of humans relating to the rest of the natural world. It initiates a dependency on fossil fuels that we are struggling to unlearn. It fueled production and transportation. It heated homes. It created a world and sowed the seeds of that world's destruction. For Taubus, there's never only destruction, though. He describes the apocalyptic principle as combining a form destroying and a forming power. One is always accompanied by the other. And up came a coal crystal garden. And you can see my experiments here on the table. Um, basically, what I've learned that um, during the Depression years in America, coal miners would uh, take any pieces of coal lying around, especially coke would also be good because that is more poor substance. And they would use material that they found in their kitchen to sort of form a solution that they would pour over the coal and from there would grow crystallized, crystallized structures and with them they would decorate their homes. So for me, these, uh, the binary code between the origin of life um, and silicon versus carbon or these crystallized structures and minerals versus the carbon uh, basis uh, was sort of brought together in these flowers of um, or growth that uh, is created and by experimenting with these growing structures i also found it was quite interesting to be just uh, meeting the the um, life force that comes with crystallized crystal crystals sort of growing and it became quite eerie, fascinating uh, way of, of watching how they would creep up the walls, like you see, of the container, and also my relationship to them, as well as these living things within my studio. It was in the 1700s that a French chemist was experimenting with and seeing if he, he could grow crystalline structures with iron salt. And from this, he conducted that iron is needed to grow um, vegetation. So at, the, at, at that point in his hypothesis, he thought that was the reason that the crystal structures were growing, it was because of the iron. So uh, before they uh, were called depression flowers, as in the time they were used to decorate the homes of the families in the America and the coal mines, they were actually called iron flowers by this chemist in uh, France in the early 19, uh, 1700s. So, Again, then I, I'm also bringing um, the the very yeah uh, the iron industry, which is sort of base bases itself on coke, um, but trying to see other animate, uh, intricate life uh, elements or um, uh, other ways of uh, yeah um, viewing viewing it. Uh, yeah, yeah. The coal once pulled from this mine, the coal that is now the basis of art, was not one fuel amongst others. In the 19th century, William Stanley Jevons wrote that coal stands not beside, but entirely above all other commodities. It is the material energy of the country, the universal aid, the factor in everything we do. Sunlight became life died and was buried, only to be resurrected to fuel our lives and our world. The end of that world is a difficult thing to think. Apocalypticism operates at the edges of philosophy and religion, literature and art. It is a form of thinking found at the limits of our ideas and imaginations. The philosopher Daniel Coluccio Barber writes that the world is both the given and the possible. The world is difficult to escape. How do we envision a new now, even as the present constantly elapses? 
Art allows us to investigate the limits of the self, the world, and the now. Hey, Elliot, thank you so much for taking the time to be talking with us. I know here at New Now Festival, you're having a quite limited time frame, so we highly appreciate, appreciate this. Thank you very much. And maybe you, we can start um, talking about this experience here for you at the festival. What is this new you're living right now and the now you're living right now? Um, I was listening recently to a conversation where they're describing how the present has become like a cause for stress. <laughs> that used to be, a, there was an anxiety about the future, that the future is going to be something to uh, worry about that might be different. But now the tension is, uh, when they say, pulling down the refresh on the page and then the now coming. And that's often where the anxiety is. So yeah, now has changed a lot, of course. Time changes. Our perception of time changes with devices, with our culture. Um, and with our lives and lifestyles, like this place had a very booming life around it. It's interesting to be in the town and see the people who worked here and to imagine how difficult it must have been when this closed, um, but also what that rhythm of the city was when it was open. So um, I think this new now festival is you know one of those first moments after coronavirus after coronavirus kind of post corona i think is vague enough um to try to get together again and talk about what ideas we found recently and what ideas that we want to test i think that's always a good thing about a festival is you um you prototype how life might be outside of it right so you um might be very radical or experimental with something in order to demonstrate what life could be like every day. Not every idea works, not every idea is comfortable or effective, but without trying we never know. Well, the moon for us, well for me anyway, is kind of a sign of what reality you're in. So often in fiction you'll see worlds with another moon, like a different moon, or in stories like 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami, when uh, Ayamami enters the second reality, she sees the second moon there, which tells her that she's the, in this new reality. And we wanted to kind of make physical this change in reality momentarily, that people can see the superposition of our digital reality and our physical reality in space at the same time and experience that spatially with our bodies by being here in this yard. I think anyway, the word apocalypse is somewhat reserved for um, when there's an enormous amount of suffering attached to it, which is, you know, something that um, we definitely want to avoid. And although there has been suffering throughout history, I don't think that we've met something we yet call an apocalypse um, from the way I understand the term. Art provides experimentations in living otherwise. Apocalypticism is fundamentally an experiment in the limits of freedom. How do we live otherwise while still in the world? This world is defined by borders and divisions between nations, genders, races, sexualities, species, and abilities. Art can refuse to be limited by this world. Then it becomes a revelation of what Nancy Tawana calls viscous porosity, the interactions between objects and subjects, both human and animal, that are supposedly separate. And art can imagine new relations between the living, the once living, and the non-living. New assemblages emerge, blurring the lines between nature and culture, the organic and the technological. We can disinvest from the world as it is and live in anticipation of other modes of being. And so what's also interesting with um, the way I, I'm using machine learning for my installation um, that I have been discovering over the last week is seeing and hearing the way machines learn data and give visuals and audio. You can see and hear this, that intersection of, um, of the physical of, of life and machinery. And I think um, that's where the 
poetry is that I am finding inspiration and hopefully that translation of the way machines create these um, new tangible formats that we can experience will maybe give us some kind of like a reminder of, of what has happened because of machines and um, how that interaction of humans and machines has made on animals. <laughs> Um, in fact, in all living things, but um, I've had a lot of goosebump moments myself just listening back to um, when you feed machines with sounds, especially like raw audio data, you get these weird glitches. And in ways, I was listening to this, um, these canary birds being resynthesized, and it sounded like machines killing birds. <laughs> and um, I think at the end of the day, I, I, I look to technology for inspiration as um, interesting tools to work with and um, so that's where that's how I've been feeling inspired because it's helping me translate uh, my own, own emotions and um, how I'm digesting all this information and such an important part of history that what is your perspective or speaking with the title of the conference another end is possible oh, wow. you said you were Driven, you're really unsure, expecting uncertainty, but where, where do you think, yeah. will it end or might it end in, in the future with technology, especially with AI? This is an interesting question because uh, philosophically I found myself starting to look at life in a very um, different way that doesn't involve an end. And I think everything's just this like constant circle <laughs> of things that go in cycles and things get regurgitated and history kind of repeats itself in interesting ways and everything gets remixed constantly. It's just like this forever evolving, doughy, messy thing that we call life. Um, and I think because of the of human nature of how we are, I think we will see amazing things happen as well as catastrophic things. Um, there's, I don't think that that's controllable um, and it's just the way it is. It's, um, I have very high hopes that we can um, do incredible things. I really do. At the same time, I, I, it would be silly to be naive to believe that something destructive will not happen. I don't know what that is. It's not something that I concentrate on, that it's not an area of my head that I um, contemplate on too much. Um, but I think we've seen many examples through entertainment media. <laughs> um, but something tells me that it's not going to be like a termi Terminator kind of ending. If it was to, if life was to end um, because of AI, I imagine it would be something so much more subtle because there's so much data. There's a lot of invisible things that happen because of machine learning and AI and a lot of the stuff that we don't even fully understand. Perhaps the world has already ended. Derrida writes that the apocalypse is long lived. The end is just taking longer than expected. Or maybe it is Marcello Tari who is right when he argues that this world has already ended. It exists but no longer has any meaning. A world that functions it is empty of meaning, is no longer a world, it is a hell. From AI to climate change, signs of the end times seem to be everywhere. Apocalypticism is a dangerous discourse, though. The feminist theologian Catherine Keller writes of its operative ambiguity. It is a discourse used both for liberation and repression. She also identifies apocalypticism's misogyny, filled with images of the poor of Babylon and virginal figures. Even in envisioning the end of the world, the world somehow creeps back in. It doesn't end. We end. Like, you know, I find it's a very uh, arrogant, anthropocentric idea uh, to think that, you know, the world's gonna end because of us. It's not going to end. It's gonna become unlivable for us. Like we're walking around here, this place super toxic, you know, behind the Kukarai and mm -hmm. there's artificial hills, you know, with moss growing. I saw moss grow inside the tunnel of the of the um, of one of the old mines, you know. Like nature, the galaxy, the universe 
has better shit to do, you know? <laughs> like it will continue to evolve as it has done for thousands upon thousands of years. So really, uh, it's not like, oh my God, you know, let's, the world's gonna end. It's us, you know? So I think if anything, we need to understand that we are in a co-creation, a collaboration, a biological collaboration, you know, with the, with the planet, with the entities, and also, so, and the subjectivity of the mm -hmm. planet and nature, because, you know, there, are, there is a subjectivity to it as well. And also look at our bodies and understand that our bodies are also like our whole, our, a whole cosmos too, you know, from, from the, the, the bacteria in our gut to, so it's, it's really to have a more plural <laughs> conversation and think about how can we coexist and stop hurting the planet. How about that? You know, it's like, we're not going to kill it, but for sure we're going to make it impossible for us if we don't do anything now. And it's already is impossible, you know? So like, it's really, really, we're really tangible. Uh, and that really, that really stayed with me, you know, before coming here, how fragile everything is, you know, like I'm saying that the earth doesn't, that the, the world doesn't end, you know, everything changes, that the earth is, is resilient, but it, it does take this massive, like, uh, like, uh, cataclysmic events, you know, to get rid of what's making it sick. And I'm not going to go here and be eco-fascist and say that, oh my God, the humans are the problem. We're absolutely not the problem. We're the, the problem is what is running in our, in our subconscious, what has programmed us. And I talk about this on my work all the time. It's white supremacist, cis-heteronormative, femphobic, patriarchal psyche that <laughs> is the system that runs and makes us behave the way we behave. And also the lack of uh, checking in with ourselves, you know, and deprogramming our avatars from this sort of behavior. And the problem is that if we don't do this, is we just keep on repeating patterns of behavior that, re, um, that reproduce these oppressive structures, violent structures, uh, to everything and to everyone. And I talk about the femophobia in particular because I'm not talking about violence to cis women. <laughs> I'm talking about, not talking even about violence to trans women. I talk about violence to anything that is perceived of the feminine, to be understood as of the feminine, the total objection to anything that would be at all in relationship to that energy. So, Mother Earth. If you look at society, what do we do to femmes in this society? This white supremacy, heteronormative, patriarchal, femphobic, psyche society. You take, you abuse, you expect it to care for you forever. But like really, there's a lot of abuse of femmes, you know, anything of the femme. We're here, like it's been absolutely extracted here, you know, for personal gain. And so that really is the core of the issue for me that deals with, with nature, that deals with humans as nature. If it is humanity that is at the risk of ending, not the world, then there is still hope. In Kafka's words, there is infinite hope, but not for us. Or if there is to be hope for us, we must become a different us. Zofarine is a monument to this potential becoming, not only as a place, but as a space a space for thinking and creating, imagining the new while surrounded by the remains of the old. Becoming a different us requires new forms of relationality, ones not dictated by the habits of the world. It requires a new politics, what Jason Moore describes as the fundamental transformation of the relations of power, knowledge, and capital that have made the modern world. He argues that if you shut down a coal plant you can slow global warming for a day, shut down the relations that made the coal plant, and you can stop it for good. To imagine the end of these relations, the end of the world, is an extreme theoretical and aesthetic act. Considering the, also the current uh, mm. climate crisis, mm. so uh, there's uh, already people thinking about going 
into outer space uh, yeah, yeah. is one of the mm. uh, solutions to uh, yeah. solve the problem. Yeah. And uh, I, I learned that you, you mm. are the founder of the Lithuanian Space Agency. Yes. Could you say a little bit about this project well, that it, you presented? It, when it comes to the uh, establishment of an agency, uh, it has quite a few uh, layers and quite a few aspects that we can discuss, but you've just touched upon climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideas that I became interested in is this uh, so-called Astro-Anthropocene, mm -hmm. which defines the uh, second uh, space age, mm -hmm. in which all kind of people from different disciplines realize that we've been always part of a cosmos. And when we, and when we talk about uh, climate, we, do, we have not forget that it has been always in dialogue with outer space and, and all kind of uh, uh, extraterrestrial circumstances under which climate is developing itself or, or living on, on its own. So in, in my particular practice, I was interested in this current time that we become aware mm -hmm. of this situation, but as well as something that might be seen as graphical language of climate <laughs> change. It, when I did this project that you mentioned, Euthanasia Coaster, yep. 10 years ago, it was such a controversial project that tens of, or hundreds of million people started to discuss around uh, about it. I've even became known as Dr. Death because of this project. Mm -hmm. Even aboriginals in Australia know this project. But now it's a bit different kind of situation because the we live in these kind of eschatological thinking and imagination times, but the, the very uh, ideas and, uh, and imagination thinking about very something that would be very extreme, radical, the end of all kinds of ends, has become mundane. Whereas 10 years or 15 years ago, it was a bit like kind of bit, uh, something that headlines would, would provoke uh, would provoke, would be controversial or would provoke, um, uh, how to say, kind of graphical language interpretation. Mm -hmm. But now we live in such times that uh, we, we are being bombarded with all kinds of uh, controversial, that are not controversial basically, ideas mm -hmm. that the graphical language of climate change Become, became not something that uh, could be considered a speculative science fiction, but rather was of everyday language, every, uh, gen everyday journalism. The end of the world can be invoked in the pursuit of many different ends. It can be a numbing agent as we confront multiplying crises. There is no need to do anything because nothing can be done. It can be used to justify the exercise of political power. If we don't act now, the world will end. The end of the world can preserve the world that is supposedly ending. Yet there is still an apocalypticism defined by its relation to a beyond, a possibility not of this world. This beyond is unthinkable and unrepresentable. It is the source of a peculiar hope, not in the future of this world, but in its end. To imagine that we can see the beyond is to inevitably reproduce the world as it is. Instead, we must seek to find the cracks of this world and to pry them open, to glimpse the abyss beyond. David Marriott writes of an abyssal that nevertheless appears in the world as an impossible limit that is recognized as such, as what surpasses limited possibility. While the abyss does not promise this or that utopia, it exposes the lie of the world the lie that the world is all that is possible. This is the destructive revelation of the apocalypse.